Over the weekend, hundreds of Turkish citizens began evacuating Sudan after nearly two weeks of clashes between the army and a paramilitary group plunged the country into chaos. The evacuations came after both Turkey's president and foreign ministers spoke to their respective counterparts about safely repatriating Turkish nationals. Over 2,500 Turkish citizens are believed to have been in Sudan when the gun battles first broke out on April 15th. Clashes between the Sudanese army and their rapid support forces continued throughout the weekend despite a 72-hour ceasefire that was declared for the Muslim holiday of Eid. The U.S., along with several other countries, have also started evacuating their citizens and diplomatic staff from the capital Khartoum. After a series of ceasefires failed to hold the death toll from nearly two weeks of fighting past 420 with more than 3,700 wounded. The violence stems from a power struggle between rival factions headed by the country's military ruler and the deputy head of the ruling council that took power in a coup in 2021. And now to further discuss the latest from Sudan and Turkey's evacuation efforts. Joining me now from Amman is Zaid Eyadat. He is the director of Center for Strategic Studies at University of Jordan. And from London, Hannah Ryder. She is the CEO of the Development Reimagined an African-led international development consultancy based in Beijing. A warm welcome to you both and thanks for joining me on Straight Talk. So Zaid, what's the latest on the evacuation efforts of um, Turkish citizens in Sudan? I mean, do you know how many people have so far been rescued there? Uh, well, thanks for having me first. Uh, and it's uh, tragic what is happening in the Sudan, uh, despite the truce that's been introduced during the Eid. Mm -hmm. uh, for the last few days, uh, still uh, fighting's continued here and there. And the evacuations processes uh, from different nations were disrupted. Uh, nonetheless, there have been a success efforts uh, on the Turkish side. Mm -hmm. uh, by ev uh, evacuating uh, good numbers of uh, our Turkish citizens, uh, you know, through communicating to them the meeting points, uh, all the document needed, etc., etc. So thus far, I think the uh, Turkish efforts by evacuating uh, Turkish uh, nationals is, uh, is going very well and according to plans. Mm -hmm. So, Hana, what do you think? Is this latest ceasefire declared uh, newly for uh, 72 hours aimed at facilitating the evacuation of foreigners? Or do you think this will hold? I think there's a real opportunity here, of course, definitely for evacuating foreigners. And um, as, as you were showing, there are foreigners not only from uh, Turkey, but uh, from from Zimbabwe to the UK, many uh, and China, many citizens are being evacuated right now. But it is also an opportunity. The African Union representatives are on the ground in Sudan. And so this is also an opportunity for um, dialogue to be facilitated mm. um, and to try to see what kind of outcomes um, could could happen after this after this ceasefire and, and hopefully continue the ceasefire. So Zaid, what do you think? Is this a good opportunity to help a dialogue? And when you look at the latest fighting, what could you tell us about the scale and intensity of it, especially in the capital? Yeah, Aisha, well, I think we need the context in here in order to see to what extent this truce will hold or not and whether it's going to be beneficial or not as well. Uh, and, and just to, to remind you and your viewers that the, the, the Sudan been actually uh, uh, under uh, and within conflict since 1956. Uh, and, you know, military and military groups always uh, come into kind of a coup and they're controlling the country for a while. And then there is a revolution against them for a few years and then erupted, disrupted, etc., etc. Latest, of course, being the 2019 uh, against Omar al-Bashir and, uh, you know, then 2021, uh, yes. Qawad uh, the, the military, uh, the two, two sides of the military uh, interfered in order to go back to square number one, where military is actually controlling and leading the country against the civilians uh, uh, and against the civilians' will. So for, for that, uh, you know, the, the five, six decades being uh, just the same game all over again. Military is actually holding power over civilians. Mm -hmm. And transforming uh, the Sudan, transitioning the Sudan into a more civil democratic state has failed. 
Uh, and despite all the hopes that, uh, you know, uh, emerged after 2019, unfortunately, it did not work. The latest uh, agreements that the American brokered between the two military sides and the uh, uh, civic democratic uh, and civil society powers in the Sudan has failed, uh, only to see this, this fighting and conflict over power uh, emerge again uh, and erupted the entire yes. process of to a more stable and, and democratic Sudan. Anna, why has the situation deteriorated all of a sudden, or were there signs already? I mean, I think everyone with hindsight will be able to look for signs and, and be able to weave a narrative about signs. Um, but obviously, there's also been, you know, increased insecurity in the world. And it's not a surprise to see that these issues then also turn into something that permeates on the ground. Look, this is a this is a it's, it's a challenge for two leaders who are fighting to retain as much power as they can. They see it as a winner takes all um, situation. And and that's why this is such a difficult conflict to mediate at this point of time. Of course, I agree with with uh, with Dr. Zaid that we do need to, of course, think about how Sudan can make a much longer term transition mm. into structural improved development. But in, in the meantime, it's very crucial that this conflict between the two leaders, in particular military leaders, um, is, is somehow found, uh, a solution is found. So, Zaid, uh, President uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan has offered to mediate between the rival military factions. He has spoken separately with both leaders. What role could Turkey play? Major role, no doubt about it. Uh, and uh, look, uh, Turkey has, uh, has its own interest and own influence on the uh, parties of the conflict between Hamiditi and the Burhan. And, you know, this is also, uh, it is not the Sudanese uh, fight conflict per se only. It is, in a way, it's a regional theater where many other countries have their own stakes into what is happening, mm -hmm. uh, from Libya to Egypt to Saudi Arabia to uh, uh, the Emiratis and others, of course, uh, leave alone the, the international players, Russia, China, the EU, Britons, and others, uh, not only for sources and resources in, in, in the Sudan, but for also geostrategic and strategic reasons. But Turkey has its own uh, its own positioning in terms of, you know, talking to the two leaders of the military uh, uh, powers, uh, Hamiditi, as I said, and, uh, and the Burhan. Uh, they do have leverage on both. And they might be able to succeed in, in uh, you know, bringing both to the table to, to discuss. Okay, so uh, Hannah, what do you make of the international community's efforts to stop the fighting in the uh, country? And do you believe there are some different approaches from the West and the Arab world, or maybe Russia from China, about the resolution of this crisis? Well, as you know, even prior to the crisis, there were uh, sanctions on Sudan, um, which has obviously exacerbated the situation that citizens especially find themselves in at this point, but also created a challenge with the resources um, for development, of course. Um, and that typically sort of the approach of sanctions is often one which is um, which is mentioned and, uh, and, and suggested as a, as a response to civil conflict. On the other hand, I think the response from Turkey and, and several others, Turkey and several others do suggest that actually this is something to try to facilitate peaceful dialogue and mediation is, is very important and useful and, 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 and a different kind of approach. But all approaches, I would say, must really respect the fact that the African Union and the Intergovernmental Authority on Development, which, is, uh, which has Sudan as its member, Plus, of course, the League of the Arab States. Mm -hmm. uh, the African Union really has been trying to take a very strong role in trying to uh, mediate in the solution. And so any uh, mediation, any offer of mediation should also be discussed and worked through with the with the African Union. And it's been good to see the African Union actually try to um, facilitate all of that coordination, uh, not only bringing in uh, uh, partners like, uh, like, like Turkey or, or China, um, but also uh, others from, from across the world, Europe and so on as well. So Zay, which, so Zay, which country is likely to be affected the most uh, by this conflict? And how is Egypt dealing with the situation right now? 
First of all, let's uh, let's all agree. I mean, uh, the suffering is all in the Sudanese, regardless uh, on, regardless on which aisle they are. So the, the Sudanese people have been actually suffering for too long, and they hoped for too long also to liberate themselves from these conflicts and these military kind of ruling, and only to find themselves and in the you know on, on, on the eve of the eve of the Eid. Uh, after the holy month of Ramadan, you know, uh, facing this kind of conflicts, so this is this is the main major country that will suffer, and then second, of course, will be the the southern Sudan and then Egypt and Ethiopia, because these are the most related bordering countries to the Sudan. And uh, when we're talking about you know refugees or people who are fleeing the war zones, uh, these are the uh, three uh, countries that will be receiving most of the Sudanese who are trying to. Yes to uh, escape uh, this war. So uh, it is actually, it is this, uh, it's this tragedy what is happening. And I guess our efforts all should be today is uh, to contain what's happening. And I, I agree with Hannah that, you know, a, a regional led efforts to mediate these things is, is essential and mm -hmm. call on now, right now, immediately. And also to come and restore the, the civilian kind of ruling with the democratic forces in the Sudan. The Sudanese can rule themselves. So Hannah, are there any similarities between Sudan and Libya when it comes uh, to the fighting of different factions backed by several outside actors? I think this has been a parallel that some have tried to draw. I would say in our analysis, we do not suggest that this is, is particularly similar. Um, of course, yes, you did have military um, factions and so on, but Sudan is a very different country to Libya. Libya is a very different country to uh, other African countries and also in the Arab region as well. Um, so we have to take in the specificities of Sudan, the specificities of the Horn of Africa as well. Um, and so... I think while while it's it's nice to kind of try and find uh, try and find analogies, actually this this conflict needs the Sudanese treatment. It needs it needs to be thought of um, as its own as its own conflict. Definitely. All right, Hannah. And, and then, Zaid, yeah, unfortunately we'll have to leave it here. Thank you very much for joining me on Straight Talk.